My voice rang out loud and very clear. I felt tense expectancy about me, the thrill of sympathy responding to my words. I got down from the cart, slow and stumbling, for my feet were stiff with cold. The police were waiting. I walked slowly away toward the Bow Road, the crowd irresolute, half turning to follow, half waiting to see if someone else would speak. A few of the women pressed round me. At the corner was a brightly lit undertaker's shop with cheap, showy monuments in its window. I took a heavy flint from my pocket and hurled it as hard as I could. It broke the glass with a loud report, passing through it as easily as though it had been butter. Three stones went flying from close beside me. They sounded like the firing of guns. Suddenly a young man darted forward with a shout, Votes for women! and flung a stone through a window in the Bromley public hall. The people applauded. Bravo! Votes for women! Matilda told such dreadful lies. It made one gasp and stretch one's eyes. Her aunt, who, from her earliest youth, had kept a strict regard for truth, attempted to believe Matilda. The effort very nearly killed her, and would have done so had not she discovered this infirmity. For once, towards the close of day, Matilda, growing tired of play, and finding she was left alone, went tiptoe to the telephone and summoned the immediate aid of London's noble fire brigade. Within an hour, the gallant band were pouring in on every hand, from Putney, Hackney Downs and Bow, with courage high and hearts aglow, they galloped roaring through the town. Matilda's house is burning down! Inspired by British cheers and loud proceeding from the frenzied crowd, they ran their ladders through a score of windows on the ballroom floor and took peculiar pains to souse the pictures up and down the house until Matilda's aunt succeeded in showing them they were not needed. And even then she had to pay to get the men to go away. It happened that a few weeks later, her aunt was off to the theatre to see that interesting play, The Second Mrs. Tanqueray. She had refused to take her niece to hear this entertaining piece, a deprivation just and wise to punish her for telling lies. That night, a fire did break out. You should have heard Matilda shout. You should have heard her scream and bawl and throw the window up and call to people passing in the street, the rapidly increasing heat encouraging her to obtain their confidence, but all in vain. For every time she shouted, Fire! They only answered, Little liar. And therefore, when her aunt returned, Matilda and the house were burned. Girls, forget what you've read. It happened like this. I did everything in my power to make him look back. What did I have to do, I said, to make him see we were through? I was dead, deceased. I was resting in peace, passé, late, past my sell-by date. I stretched out my hand to touch him once on the back of his neck. Please let me stay. But already the light had saddened from purple to grey. It was an uphill schlep from death to life, and with every step I willed him to turn. I was thinking of filching the poem out of his cloak, when inspiration finally struck. I stopped, thrilled. It was a yard in front. My voice shook when I spoke. Oh, yes, your poem's a masterpiece. I'd love to hear it again. He was smiling modestly when he turned, when he turned. And he looked at me. What else? I noticed he hadn't shaved. I waved. And he was gone. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pasture seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark, satanic mills?
Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear. O oh, clouds, unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Mayonnaise has turned when it refuses to thicken, or in a finished mayonnaise, when the oil releases itself from suspension and the sauce curdles. In either case, the remedy is simple. Warm a mixing bowl in hot water. Add one teaspoon of prepared mustard and one tablespoon of sauce. Beat with a wire whisk for several seconds until they cream and thicken together. Beat in the rest of the sauce by teaspoons, thickening each addition before adding the next. This always works. Just be sure you add the turn sauce a little bit at a time, particularly at first. The sauce will thicken into a very heavy cream and the crisis is over. She went up to her boudoir. The open bow window let in the serene glory of the afternoon lying in the avenue, where the lime trees cast long shadows. But Dorothea knew nothing of the scene. She threw herself on a chair, not heeding that she was in the dazzling sun rays. If there were discomfort in that, how could she tell that it was not part of her inward misery? She was in the reaction of a rebellious anger, stronger than any she had felt since her marriage. Instead of tears, there came words. What have I done? What am I, that he should treat me so? He never knows what is in my mind. He never cares. What is the use of anything I do? He wishes he had never married me. She began to hear herself and was checked into stillness. Like one who has lost his way and is weary, she sat and saw, as in one glance, all the paths of her young hope which she should never find again. And just as clearly in the miserable light, she saw her own and her husband's solitude, how they walked apart, 
so that she was obliged to survey him. If he had drawn her towards him, she would never have surveyed him, never have said, is he worth living for? But would have felt him simply a part of her own life. Now, she said bitterly, it is his fault, not mine. In the jar of her whole being, pity was overthrown. Was it her fault that she had believed in him, had believed in his worthiness? And what exactly was he? She was able enough to estimate him, she who waited on his glances with trembling and shut her best soul in prison, paying it only hidden visits, that she might be petty enough to please him. In such a crisis as this, some women begin to hate. Dear babe, that sleepest cradled by my side, whose gentle breathings, heard in this deep calm, fill up the interspersed vacancies and momentary pauses of the thought. My babe so beautiful, it thrills my heart with tender gladness thus to look at thee and think that thou shalt learn far other lore and in far other scenes. For I was reared in the great city, pent mid cloisters dim, and saw naught lovely but the sky and stars. But thou, my babe, shalt wander like a breeze by lakes and sandy shores, beneath the crags of ancient mountain, and beneath the clouds, which image in their bulk both lakes and shores and mountain crags. So shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters, who from eternity doth teach himself in all, and all things in himself. Great universal teacher, he shall mould thy spirit, and by giving, make it ask. Therefore, all seasons shall be sweet to thee, whether the summer clothe the general earth with greenness, or the red breast sit and sing betwixt the tufts of snow on the bare branch of mossy apple tree, while the nigh thatch smokes and the sun thaw, whether the eavedrops fall heard only in the trances of the blast, or if the secret ministry of frost shall hang them up in silent icicles, quietly shining to the quiet moon. <laughs> 